The Being an Engineer podcast is a repository for industry knowledge and a tool through which engineers learn about and connect with relevant companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. Enjoy the show. How about we understand the humans before we start figuring out what problem it is we're trying to solve? Hello and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Uh, we're speaking with Rich Sheridan today, who is CEO and Chief Storyteller at Menlo Innovations, uh, which is a successful uh, entrepreneur and author of two best-selling books, Joy Inc., How We Built a Workplace People Love, and Chief Joy Officer, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear. Uh, Rich's passion for inspiring organizations to create their own joy-filled cultures has led him to address audiences around the world as well as throughout the United States. Uh, Rich doesn't just talk about joy in the workplace. He lives it every day at Menlo, the, the custom software and consulting company he co-founded in 2001 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So that, that is the, the formal introduction, Rich, but I have to add my own little introduction as well. Uh, I I have to admit I'm, I'm a little bit starstruck right now. You have been uh, uh, kind of an, an idol or a, a hero of mine for several years, ever since I read Joy Inc. Um, I've had Lisa and Andrew from your team on my show in the past, and they were delightful and wonderful. I, I actually did one of your virtual Menlo tours, and I've taken your, your project management workshop. So anyway, all that is to say I'm, I'm a huge fan and just so excited and grateful that uh, you're able to spend some time with me on the podcast today. Well, great to be with you, Aaron. It's always fun to be with a fan, especially one that spends money with us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Yes, this is fantastic. Okay. Well, can you take just a couple of minutes and uh, share with the listeners, um, y- y- you know, your your story? Where did you start, and and um, uh, how how Menlo Innovations came to be? Yeah, and um, Aaron, I know a lot of your audience are in the technical field, engineering field, and so on. So I can relate to that. I started out like in software. I was a programmer. Uh, you know, some refer to us at, in some realm as software engineering. Uh, software engineers, I think sometimes that's a stretch of the term engineer, given our traditional methods aren't as solid as many other engineering methods. Uh, but I'm certainly on a mission to change that myself in, inside of our industry. Uh, but I started out typing code. And, you know, what's fun is right now, just about this very day, 50 years ago, in September of 1971, Wow. As a freshman in high school, I touched a computer for the first time. It's a teletype. It clacked out on a roll of paper. I typed in a two-line program, typed the word run. It came back in the roll of paper, said, hi, Rich, because that's what I told it to do. And I'll be honest, I was hooked. I knew what I wanted to do the rest of my days. I'm 63 now. I was 13 then. And I'm still in the same profession. So I think I chose pretty darn well. Yeah. But in the midst of a lovely engineering career rise, when I went from programmer, I wanted to the career to vice president of R&D at the other end, I was falling out of love with the profession I thought would carry me for a lifetime. Probably, I'm going to just guess, some of your listeners I will find themselves from time to time, or maybe for a long time like I was, in their personal trough of disillusionment because things aren't going as well as they wanted them to. And that's what was happening for me. I saw problems. I saw trouble. I was firefighting every day. I was answering difficult phone calls from angry customers because the software we designed wasn't working for them or wasn't working at all. And, you know, just long nights, uh, lots of time away from family, just trying to fix problems that we had created in the past. And I was consumed by a thought. I was consumed by a thought, perhaps the same reason people come and listen to your podcast. I thought things could be better, way better, and I was determined to find it. And my journey out led me to authors and books. That's why I love being an author now, because I know books can inspire. Clearly, that's why we're talking, because my book inspired you, and I love that. But what I wanted more than anything else from an engineer's heart was 
what I believe is the only thing that thrills an engineer in their work, and that is to see their work get out into the world and delight the people it's intended to serve. There is no, everything else in the engineering world is a compromise. If we don't get to do that, we have to find something else to give us joy, whether it's a paycheck or a title or where is my office or how fast is my computer or anything like that. But the real joy of an engineer is to see the work of their hearts, their hands, and their minds get out into the world and delight the people it's intended to serve. We are servant hearted people in the engineering profession. We do work to delight others. I'll bet like most of your audience, like me, loves to do projects on the weekends at home, building something for someone else. I just helped my daughter and her husband do this nice little shiplap wall in their house. And they were so delighted. And when they were done, I'm like, I did this with my hands. This is a big deal. And so Menlo Innovations, the company I founded now 20 years ago, we just passed our 20th birthday in June, um, was built to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. We wanted to return joy to what we believe is one of the most unique endeavors mankind has ever undertaken, the invention of software. And so, and I'll be honest, we did it. We are living proof that a better way is possible we found it. We apply it every single day. This is not a theoretical discussion you and I are going to have. These are very practical techniques we use to get to that kind of joy here every single day. Well, I can see why you hold the title Chief Storyteller because I just get chills listening to you, Rich. That was that was wonderful. Um, maybe a good segue is uh, if I was if I were a visitor at Menlo Innovations. I know things are a little bit different now with, with COVID, but you know, generally speaking, if I were to walk into Menlo, what what would I see? H- how is your environment put together in a way that facilitates this non-theoretical, but actually in practice and, and working model that you've developed? Yeah, and I will tell you, it's not only what you see, it's what you don't see, and it's what you feel when you walk in the room. You know, Aaron, as you know, we, we bring guests in uh, by the thousands every year. People come from all over the world just to come see how we do what we do because it's so different. And I have often had the chance at our big front glass door as it opens to walk in with our guests so I can hear their response when they first walk in the room. And almost universally, the first word out of people's mouths the first time they ever visit is, And I think their reaction isn't to what they're seeing as much as what they're feeling because they can actually feel the human energy in the room. Now, what they see and what they don't see are important. What they don't see are walls and offices and cubes and doors. What they see is one big open room. Yes, one of those open office environments that are often vilified in most magazines. And then they see how the people are organized, sitting two people to one computer, talking to each other all day long. The tables are pushed together. The team has full control over the space, and they choose to push the tables, these little five-foot tables, front to front, side to side, lightweight aluminum tables, teams in full charge of exactly how the tables are laid out, and they choose to push them together. So not only are they working shoulder to shoulder in pairs at computers, but the pairs themselves are working shoulder to shoulder around a group of tables, and they're in conversation. There's no headphones. There's no earbuds. There's, you know, it is a noisy environment, which is where that human energy comes from, but it's not the noise of chit chat. It's actually the noise of work. Well, you mentioned uh, the mission that Menlo has, which is to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology, which I just love so much. And I, I recently read Simon Sinek's book, The Infinite Game, and he talks about this, this idea of a just cause which I think your mission very much qualifies as to end human suffering as it relates to technology. Um, I, I recently came up with, with my own mission statement. I've been, I've been thinking about the messaging at Pipeline for years and I kind of bounced back and forth and back and forth. But really it was those two things, uh, Simon Sinek's book and reading, 
uh, Menlo's mission that, that helped me finally land on what, what I, I think is the right mission statement for us, which, which is to develop, uh, equipment that R and D and manufacturing teams love to use mm. because I've had so many interactions with these teams using equipment that is just hard to use. And you know, these poor operators are spending more time trying to make the equipment work than getting their job done. Anyway, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came uh, up with this this mission statement. Well, you know, I, fun for me, uh, I have three daughters. Uh, they're all adults now in their own work lives and so on. And uh, I was one time having a discussion with my middle daughter who also uh, went down a technical path and got a master's degree in data science. And she's like, Dad, I want what you have in your career. I want the joy you're experiencing. And I smiled. I said, well, Lauren, you got to understand my joy was born out of 15 years of utter pain. So <laughs> this didn't come overnight. It wasn't like I woke up one day and said, oh, I got this great new way of working. I'm going to go work this way. No, this was my own personal pain, right? What was I seeing in my life, in my career? So, you know, anybody who knows software and, you know, and quite frankly, most other engineering professions know we often live in chaos, right? You know, things go bump in the night. You're being pushed. You're working. You're tired. You're working overtime. You're trying to get something done. And somebody's pushing you beyond your limits and you get it out the door and it breaks the second it gets out there. And people hate it because they don't understand how to use it. And, you know, that was my life, you know running from emergency to fire to fight to to difficult phone calls to to meetings inside the company about blown budgets and missed deadlines and you know and all this kind of stuff and i'm like man it's just got to be a better way and what i saw was three kinds of suffering in this in this world in in my world um one was for the people who pay for software to be built who are often greatly disappointed in the results, so even though they sometimes they spend hundreds of millions of dollars and the projects have nothing to show for it. And the second is for the people who use it, those poor end users who my industry has learned to call stupid users. And then we write dummies books for those poor people. Like what other industry can get away with calling the people they serve stupid and they write dummies books for them. And then, then we get them to self face and say, Oh, you know me, I'm just a stupid user. And what we supposed to stand there and go, good. We got you right where we want you. No. What if we honored the people we intended to serve and delight them with their users experience without making them think like me? Cause that's the problem, you know, is that, most software engineers write code and, and they don't understand why nobody knows how to use it because they're like, oh, it makes sense to me. It's like, great, but you don't do the kind of work they do. You don't think like they do. They don't think like you do. Why Why should we make them think like the computer? Why don't we make the computer think like them? So that was a big piece. And the third piece for me was the people who do the work. You know, W. Edwards Deming said it best. He says, all anyone wants is a chance to work with pride. And that's what I wanted. I wanted that for me and I wanted it for them. I wanted it for the people who work for me. Because if you, you know, and I will tell you, there are many people in the software engineering profession who have worked for years on a project and then something goes wrong, a budget gets blown, a deadline gets missed, and some boss comes in and says, hey guys, by the way, the project you've been working on for the last five years, it's canceled. And, you know, and I'll guarantee you, most people in our profession busted their butts for with overtime and weekends to try and hit this crazy deadline. And then the boss comes in and cancels it. And, and you know, and somebody might say, well, you've got, still got a job. You still got a paycheck. No, no, that's not what this is about. Think how dispirited and demoralized a team is that has their project canceled like that. How many times can you go through that in your career? And I saw it all the time. And so those kind of sufferings for the people who pay for the work, for the people who will one day use the work, and for the people who do the work, that's where I wanted to end the suffering. That's fantastic. Uh, this idea of, of joy is a central focus of your books and of the way that, that you've built Menlo. Can you share a little about how you hit upon using joy as, as one of the building blocks of your business? 
you know, it's funny. It goes back to an author we both appreciate, Simon Sinek. He started giving his famous Start With Why talk probably back around 2010. It's just a TEDx uh, Puget sound talk. I mean, and now it's like one of the most YouTube, watch YouTube videos in the history of mankind. And, but, you know, Simon Sinek wasn't Simon Sinek back then like he is now. And he was just giving this talk and he drew these three simple circles. And he said, most people know what they do. A lot of them know why, how they do it, but almost no one knows why they do what they do. And he said, if you look at the famous companies, the ones who are excelling, they start with their why, they talk about their how, and maybe they get to their what. And that really convicted me. I saw that in about 2010. And quite frankly, somebody who saw that video sent it to me and they said, Rich, you do this. You do exactly what Simon says. You start with why. And I thought about it. I said, no, I really don't. I, I talk about we're a software design and development firm. We have this unusual way of working. Two people, one computer. I might eventually get to the why, the joy, the, the ending of human suffering. But quite frankly, it was the third thing, and it might be last, and it might not get talked about at all, depending on how the conversation went. And I was convicted. I thought, you know what? We have a strong why inside here. I'm going to start with why the next time I give it to her. And I had this group coming in. They were assembling at the front door, and I was ready for them, and, but I wasn't ready. I was like, what am I going to say? What would I, how would I express my why to them, right? And I went back and I looked at our mission statement that had been there almost since our founding. And I saw the end human suffering. I said, that's it. I'm going to spend the whole time opening up, talking about suffering. I want when people think about Menlo, I want them thinking about suffering. And I said, no, 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 that's not it. <laughs> and then finally, almost waiting for me like a gift at the bottom of our mission statement, said our goal since our founding in 2001 is to return joy to software development. And I thought, that's it. That's our why. That's why we exist. That's what we believe. So I get this group come in. I said, hey, welcome to Memo. You've come to a place that has very intentionally created a culture focused on the business value of joy. And Aaron, the first time I did this, their eyes went wide. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> why are you right, talking yeah. about joy? We're, like, We're here to learn about this crazy software team you have and how you work. And I said, okay. And then they asked me, they said, what difference would joy make? And I challenged them right back. I said, okay, I'm going to take you back and show you our team, show you how they work, what they do, how we do it, all that kind of stuff. I said, but pretend for a moment that you were bringing a software project here, something important to you. And that some weird reason back in that room, half of those people had joy and the other half didn't. Which half would you want working on your project? And they said, well, we'd want the joyful half, of course. I said, why? Why would you care? What difference would it make? And they said, well, they'd care more about the outcome. They'd be more productive. They, they'd be easier to work with. You know? <laughs> they, you know, they'd produce better quality. I'm like, okay, so you're with me. There is, in fact, tangible business value to joy. This is not some ethereal topic. I said, now let me take you back and show you how we work. And everything you see here, everything you don't see here, I can draw a short, straight line back to joy. And I will tell you, Aaron, at that point, it changed everything. I got invited to Phoenix to give a talk to the ASQ conference. Your audience will probably know the American Society for Quality conference on Lean and Six Sigma. These are pretty serious mathematicians at this conference. And I am about to talk to them about joy. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is the riskiest thing I've ever done on the stage of my life. And when I got done, they stood up, they applauded, and they rushed the stage to grab wow. every piece of material I brought. And I knew I'd hit a nerve here, something that was really important. Because let's face it, how many of us, no matter what our professions are, are living lives of quiet desperation at work? Yeah. We... I recently introduced this this new mission statement to my team for Pipeline, this um, uh, developing equipment that R&D and manufacturing teams love to use. And um, just a few days after I first introduced it, one of my engineers came up to me and he said, you know, I was working on this project and I was thinking about what you said about building equipment that people love to use. And it made me change my approach a little way. Mm. And I thought to myself, wow. 
it's maybe it's this working. really is the right thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's working. Someone uh-huh. actually listened to what I yeah. said and it affected the way that they worked. And then um, we recently delivered that project and the, the customer uh, sent us an email just yesterday, I think it was, and said, hey, this is working great. We love this thing. We love using it. And I thought, wow, it is, it's yeah. like, oh, what what a tremendous feeling. And, and uh, the customer sent it to my engineer and just kind of copied me. And and uh, I could see just the, the pride in this engineer mm-hmm. of what he had done and delivered to the customer. And, and it was that joy that you're talking about, you know. It's, it's funny. We go to work. We don't think about uh, joy because the word joy, that doesn't really fit with, right. with uh, Not you know, work, corporate yeah. America. Yeah. Joy's for, joy's for after work. You know? e- exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, you know, talk about that family, at church or in your family faith, or something. School, yes. Yes. Sports, this is work. This like is that. serious yep. stuff. But I saw joy in this this engineer. I could hear it in his voice, and um, so I, I agree 100 percent with with everything you're saying. I just I love it so much. Well, and I and I tell people that you know if we can get to that point where we delight others, the thing an engineer wants more than anything else, and you described it exactly, is they want people to come back later and say, "Really, you got to work on that." I love that product. I use it every day. Now, the yeah. beautiful thing is, I, in, I, I, I'm going to make a guess about your mission, the way you've described it, that the people you're talking about who are going to love what you do don't aren't actually your customers in the sense of they don't pay for – the people who use your product don't pay for your product to use – their employer buys it. Some procurement team buys it. Your salespeople are selling to a purchasing agent inside the company. And eventually one day your product shows up on a plant floor somewhere and somebody's got to use it. They don't know who you are. They don't know. And they probably are cynical. Like, oh, here we get another piece of this, you know, new equipment that's supposed to be so good. And then all of a sudden they start using it. They're like, wow, this is amazing. I love it. This makes my life better. My job is better now. Thank right. you. And then yeah. they start fighting their way back up the chain to find you or find your team and say, who did this? I've never had a product that's so easy to use. And that, I will tell you, and you've got the story now, which is beautiful. It is pure joy. There's no question. And I'll tell you, the storytelling part of my title is an important one. And you've got a story now. Tell that story over and over and over again because it's an important part of what you're trying to accomplish. I hadn't even thought about that, but you're absolutely right. I need to remember to tell this story, mm-hmm. not just to our customers, but to our team. You absolutely. Know? Yep. Yeah. Especially to your team. Especially to my team. Because it's yeah. hard work. What you do is hard, right? You can't be happy every minute of every day. No, nope. this is hard work, and it takes yeah. a long time. I'm guessing w- w- the products you build are not like, "Hey, let's put together a new product for our team next week." No, this <laughs> is e- often probably years of labor, yeah. and then one day those joyful messages come back, and you got to share them, and you got to share them over and over again, or people forget the mission. Right? It, it can't just be a poster on the wall or a once a year rah rah speech. Yep, absolutely. One one of the um the critical factors in Menlo's joyful culture is this idea of pairing. Can you talk a little bit more about what is pairing? How did you come across the idea of pairing and, and how have you been able to make that work? Yeah. It, the concept came to me uh, in a book uh, that I read back in, you know, call it 1999, early 2000 by a guy, a fellow programmer named Kent Beck who I think was just as frustrated as I was with his own career. And he kept asking himself, do I always fail? Or are there some projects that actually succeed? And he started analyzing the success stories, which I like that kind of approach, right? Don't don't try and figure out what's wrong and how to fix it. Figure out what's working and how to replicate it. And that's what he did. He said, he started asking himself some important questions that he cataloged in this book that I eventually read called Extreme Programming Explained. And what he said was, you know, almost every big project I worked on failed. The projects that really succeeded were the tiny projects, the short projects, the projects with a clear outcome in a short period of time that I get feedback on. And so his thought was, what if we just take the big projects and make 
make them a series of smaller projects, right? And this birthed the whole iterative and incremental approach to software development that ultimately led to the agile software development movement. And so he just started looking at all these little things he did on the projects that wildly succeeded. And he came on this idea, he says, you know, when we had to hit a deadline and it had to work the first time and it had to be high quality, I'd usually go grab Aaron and I'd pull him next to me and say, hey, Aaron, come here, sit with me while I type in this code. And check me as I'm typing things in, ask me questions about it, You know, double check me, challenge me. And he said that code was always rock solid. And he says, if that works so well in crisis, What's the possibility it could work all the time? And that was the idea of turning up these practices, as he put it, to the extreme. And so he said, if we use them in crisis, why don't we think about using them all the time? Now, one of his crisis modes, which I could completely relate to, even though I had the same pair programming experience he did under certain deadline issues, he said, how often when there was a big crisis, did people say, hey, guys, let's just commandeer the big conference room. Let's not go to our offices for the next month. Let's just hang together in one big room, shoulder to shoulder with the whiteboards nearby and just like work through this thing. And, and, and everybody who ever had that experience in their careers was like, you know what? That was the best work time I ever had. I can't believe how much we got done in such a short period of time. I can't believe how much fun it was. I can't believe how supported. I can't believe how much energy I brought to work. I wanted to get to work early, stay late because there was this camaraderie. There was this human energy. We got shit done. (laughs) And so now what happens, right? The project ends and everybody goes back to their offices and cubes and they lament the slowness, the bureaucracy, the meeting load, the slow decision or no decision making and all that kind of stuff. And Kent just asks the question, why don't we work like that all the time? And that's why Menlo has no walls, offices, cubes, or doors. So the pairing concept came out of that book. And I will tell you, it was not well received when I first brought it out. (laughs) First time I suggested to my team, hey, guys, I'm thinking I'm going to pull you out of your offices and cubes. I just read this book. We put you out in a big open room. Have you share a computer and have you share your code? And they looked at, they wouldn't even look at me. I mean, at first, first blush, you know, I was a VP of R&D, so I had the perch. I could make this happen if I wanted to, but I knew making stuff happen that way isn't good leadership and you don't get a lot of good followership. They wouldn't even make eye contact with me, Aaron. They, they looked down at the floor. They're like, oh God, let him, you know, please, you know, if I don't look at him, he'll go away and he'll forget <laughs> he'll, this he'll idea. He'll forget right? about it sooner or later. And finally, one of my guys raises his hand. I said, Gil, tell me what you think about this idea. And he says, Rich, blood, mayhem, murder. Don't do it. Don't pull me out of my office. Don't put me out in a big open room. Don't make me share a computer. And please, for God's sake, don't let me share my code. It's my code. But I did have two guys who wanted to try it. They came to me afterwards. They didn't. They saw the controversy, so they didn't want to say anything in the meeting. And they said, we just want to try this. One of the guys had already told me he was quitting because he was frustrated as I was. And he was at the front lines. I was at the top of the deck there. And he said, you know, Rich, I need a reference on my resume. I'm, I'm not going to stay here. I'm too frustrated like you are, but I got to, I got to leave. But he was one of the guys who volunteered to try this pairing thing. And he stopped me three weeks later in the parking lot as we were walking into the office. And he says, Rich, are you still going to pay me to work here? I said, what? He goes, this pairing thing is so much fun. We're getting so much done. It doesn't even feel like work anymore. I'm not sure I should get paid. So this, <laughs> these were my responses, Aaron. Blood mayhem, murder. I will work for you for free. <laughs> so, Polar opposites. And, yep. And you know what I found? Mm-hmm. If you're making important changes. You're pay attention to the energy from the edges, and those were two edge energies, right at opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, and it worked. That's that's amazing. So we have tried the pairing approach. We did it on two or three projects and on, on all of them, we went over budget and so we stopped doing it. And I, I imagine there are others out there who have heard this pairing philosophy and who have tried it and for whatever reason decided, no, we can't do it and kind of went back to the way that things were. What, what coaching or advice would you give, uh, groups like mine or the others out there who have tried this? Uh, to, to successfully implement pairing? Well, 
you know, again, I, I'm a, uh, let me be very clear. Uh, we are a living, breathing example of a company that does things the way we do them. I write books about them. I give talks about them. People come in at doors, but in no way am I trying to tell anybody we have found the one true way of working. Okay. So I just want to be very clear. I, you know, I, I will be a big advocate for pairing for a bunch of different reasons. The real key, Aaron, is, and this is important as software is probably important in your world is because people always ask me, how much does this cost? And what's the cost benefit analysis? And the question I always ask them back is, or the statement I make back is it depends on where you measure. Mm, yeah, right. I can see that. Because if you're talking about typing speed, we're cutting that in half because only two hands out of four are on the keyboard. Yeah. So now I can guarantee you programming has never been about typing speed, right? Ever. Right. If right. it was, we'd be sending all our programmers to Mavis Beacon's typing classes or something <laughs> like that. Right. <laughs> but it's never been about typing speed. It's always been about problem solving. And so now the question is where where else could you measure to see what the true cost is? And what we choose to do is is measure out at the ends of the project, after the software is delivered, how much rework is being asked for? How many catastrophes are you having? How many firefights? How much emergency work do you have to do to repair the work of, I will simply say, the incomplete problem solving of individual heroes working on their own, especially when they're tired? And so for us, when we measure how far, here's the measurement I have. I mean, it's as concrete a measurement as I can give you. In my old life, pre menlo pre-moving to this kind of model, um, I would guess I had on average two software emergencies on average per day. Per day. Per wow. day. Firefighting galore. Phones ringing off the hook with problems. Problem reports stacking up. You know, everybody unhappy. The people who do the work demoralized because they never had a chance to work with pride, as Deming said. And it was just, that was my life. That was what I was trying to escape. We are 20 years in here, 20 years into this process. Now, I'm not going to claim that it's just about pairing, but this is a significant part of what we do. Two. Remember I said two a day? Yeah. Two in 20 years. Two software emergencies in 20 years. Most of my team who's only worked here, came here out of college, worked here for even 15 years, still doesn't, still has never directly experienced it because they weren't on the projects where they occurred. Can you imagine you went, you're going to go your whole career potentially without ever having a software emergency. I even have to tell them what that means. They don't even understand when I tell them. They're like, what do you mean emergency? What does an emergency look like? Oh, that doesn't mean is we're free. It doesn't mean we're bug free, but we are emergency free. And the quality that's produced by two people working together, sends quality through the roof. Yeah. Even the mathematicians of Six Sigma get it when they look and they're like, oh my gosh, you move source and inspection to the same point in time and space. Of course, quality is going to improve. Because if I type something wrong and you catch it right there, that's going to save us months down the road. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of our projects go pretty well, but there are a handful that don't go well. And one of the things that we have identified is rushing a design out the door. Uh, we're trying to meet, meet a deadline and we, we, we start ordering custom hardware that we've designed without, you know, 100% doing a really detailed design review of, uh, uh, of, of the equipment. And then we get stuff in and, and yeah, we, you know, we, we started procurement on time, but then we get the parts in and, oh, this hole isn't in the right place. And, we need a slot in this area and oh the finish isn't correct on on these aluminum parts and all of a sudden it's you know dozens and dozens of hours and potentially weeks that that we fall behind because of these things uh and and were we to have whether it's pairing or just a, a better discipline and and say no we're not going to send this out until we're, we've you know gone through our full process uh, a lot of those problems just just wouldn't happen. So I could fully appreciate um, uh, the the quality uh, improvement that comes with pairing. 
And here's the other thing. Uh, pairing, like everything else, is a skill. You can't, if you took two of your people and said, hey, you're going to pair now. The first problem is they're like, well, how would that work? Well, how would we do this? Well, would, you know, what, you know. <laughs> and then the other problem is, and this is what usually happens when people experiment with this, because remember, in our world, the two people are working on the same task at the same time. It yeah. is their co-owned task. Typical pairing environment is, hey, Aaron, can you come here and help me for a little while? Well, every minute you're spending with me, whatever you're supposed to be working on is falling further and further and further behind. Right, right. So you're not quite in with me on this, right? Because you're like, you're, half your brain at least is like, I got to get back to work or I'm going to be late for dinner tonight and I'm going to have to come Absolutely. in this weekend to finish my other work. And we yeah. alleviate that in our world because, no, no, this is your task together. And yeah. there is no other thing to go back to. Yeah. That's fantastic. How <clears throat> how many people are are on your team, and is everyone there uh, working in pairs, or are there some people who don't? Yeah, we typically we have a team about fifty to fifty five. The pandemic took a bit of a bite out of that when the economic calamity of the pandemic hit. We're growing fast to get back up to that number, and we hope to be back up to that by the end of the year. Um, but uh, our so the majority of our team are programmers, and it is universally true our programmers are always working in pairs. We have we have very few rules at Menlo, but the strongest one is no single line of production code can be written unless you are sitting there with your peer partner. Okay, that's enforced by the peers, not and the peers, the pairs and the peers of the pairs. There's no manager walking around saying, "Hey, where are you guys going?" No, it's just enforced by the team. Uh, our high-tech anthropologists, who are the people who go out into the world and study the people that ultimately are going to use the software to make sure we're designing something that will delight them, uh, often, most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time, are working in pairs. Our QA, quality advocates, as we call them, or checking the code, they are typically working in pairs. Our project managers pair with our clients, uh, but they will work singleton, but they work you know, a little pod together. So close collaboration so they can back each other up when they take vacations and such. And then, you know, we find that it helps to do pairing like at accounting tax season time, because there's a lot of attention to detail that can get us through the tax season with a lot, without a lot of errors, corrections, resends, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, and I actually, I will tell you what I've discovered over 20 years is everywhere we are not pairing, represents a weak point in our systems. Oh, wow. Very interesting. All right. I, I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit with this this next question. Um, so we've talked a lot about, and we've only really scratched the surface with the details of how Menlo works, but um, I'm going to ask a, a little bit more broad question for this next one. What What are one or two things that you see leaders in technology doing uh, leaders in technology doing wrong these days? Well, let me tell you what I did wrong for a long time, and then everybody in your audience can decide whether they do it too. Uh, I was brought up in a fear-based environment. You know, when I learned, when I was coming up the ranks, uh, I had bosses who tried to motivate me with fear. And of course, they had promoted me, and, and I eventually ended up in my first leadership position. Uh, and guess what? I was taught to lead with fear by my bosses. They were smart enough to promote me. Why wouldn't I lead people with fear? Right. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, sharing stuff that people need to know that could frighten them, you know, in terms of safety or quality or that sort of thing. I mean, there are things we should be afraid of that are really healthy, right? That's why we don't walk out in the street without looking. Right, ways. right. But I'm talking about the artificial fear we often use to motivate. Uh, you know, Tom Peters, one of my favorite authors, says this saying about management by walking around, right? Just go out and get, get together with your people, get to know them. And Tom's purpose behind that uh, statement is very noble. And, and the managers who do that well really succeed and excel. Well, I had a boss who I, I took that to the nth degree, and, and, and I call it management by walking around and annoying people. So, you know, you'd be, you'd be working away on some goal, and all of a sudden he'd pop up behind you and say, hey, how's it going? Yeah, good. What you working on? <laughs> well, the project you gave me two days ago. How's that going? 
Are you going to hit the deadline? Well, I, I hope so. You know, of course, I was on my way until you got here, you know. <laughs> At least that's what was going on in my head. And they'd be like, you coming in this weekend? Oh, no. <laughs> and I'll tell you, when, by the time you said that, it was clear. That was not a question. That was an expected yeah. Behavior, right? Oh. And or you tell me, hey, Rich, if you see two people in a corridor talking to each other, just walk up to them and stand there. They'll get back to work. So this is the environment I was brought up in, and I learned to do that. And I, you know, <laughs> I I'll be at conferences sometimes, and I'll do the, hey, how's it going? I'll just walk out into the audience, walk up to somebody like you, and go right up to their table. And say, how's it going, Aaron? You almost done. <laughs> How's that project you're working on? And I look at him and say, can you feel your blood pressure rising right now? Uh, <laughs> and here's the problem with this. And this is why it's a mistake. Because, you know, there's going to be some of your call like, oh, that's the way my boss leads me. And that's the way I lead and that sort of thing. I think that's a good thing, right? That's how you get the most out of your people. It's like, well, not really. Because here's the problem with fear. It shuts down the most interesting human part of our brain. When we get adrenaline and cortisol pumping through our veins, it's channeling oxygen away from our brain, this physiological response to our extremities because we're now in fight or flight mode. We can feel our stomach tighten, right? We can feel our muscles clenching. We can probably feel our jaw clenching and all that kind of stuff. And the part of our brain we shut down is the part of our brain that's responsible for creativity, imagination, innovation, and invention. And Aaron, there ain't a company on the planet left that doesn't need those four things in ginormous quantities today because it is the only thing that differentiates us anymore. Everybody's worried about computers and machine learning and big data and artificial intelligence taking away all our jobs. Well, let me tell you, the jobs are not going to take away the ones that require creativity, innovation, invention, and imagination. We got to keep our teams in their most human spot as much as possible. And are there a couple of, of um, I mean, tactile things that you can recommend leaders do to promote environments in which um, people are led by um, uh, uh, whatever the opposite of fear is, joy or love, as opposed to yep. fear? Yeah, you know, I wrote a book called Joy, Inc., and somebody asked me, what's the opposite of that? I said, fear, Inc. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so... Uh, and again, I'll, I'll just share with you how far we go in this. And, you know, your audience will probably be like, oh, my gosh, I can't even imagine. We go to, to a level of transparency that's kind of mind blowing. Right? We're open book with our financials, good times or bad. Because, again, we're not trying to frighten people with our financials. But here's my general managerial edict. If you don't share information with your team, whatever it happens to be, they will make up something in their heads mm. and they never make up a better story than the truth. They always make up a worse story, right? Wow, you walk out of a meeting insightful. with a frown on yeah. your face. They're like, Oh my gosh, did you see Aaron? He's frowning today. What does that mean? Everybody spends the next half an hour trying to read the tea leaves when, you know, you found out that your favorite football team, you know, just lost their star receiver to a ACL injury. And that's why you were upset. You know? Yeah. And they're thinking, oh, my God, we're going out of business. Right? I'm pretty sure, you know, <laughs> Doors we're all going to get laid off next week. Did you see the look on Aaron's face? So we just share. We share. We, we're transparent with our pay. Everybody knows here what everybody's making. I mean, that's crazy. That's a, I mean, again, I just saying, you know, remember, I'm just providing you an example. I'm not saying sure. you should go do this. Yeah. But our level of transparency on projects, because my, we have a poster in the room that says, Fear doesn't make bad news go away. Fear makes bad news go into hiding. Well, we can't hide any of this stuff because it's all out on the walls for people to see. The transparency we have here is remarkable. And, of course, that says we trust our team. And they feel that trust. So they feel more comfortable here because they're like, wow, you know, Rich and James aren't keeping all these little secrets from us about how we run the company and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, and that's, that's a big deal. And, um, you know, so I, I would say that would be, that would be one direction I would go, uh, is, is that. That's a great one. That's a very, uh, tactical approach that we can all chip away at a little bit at a time, you know, iteratively. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, 
in-person interactions has always been a really important part of, of the Menlo way. And over the last year and a half, that's been a challenge for all of us, right, because of the, the pandemic. And uh, I know Menlo has shifted to uh, a virtual platform, at least during this time. Um, has that changed fundamentally the, the way you think about the importance of in-person work environments? Uh, do, do you still feel like really that that's, you know, almost the only way to really be the most effective? Or do you think that uh, some kind of hybrid virtual slash in-person environment can be as effective? And remember, you're talking to a guy for 19 years, wrote books, gave talks. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. I live this thing behind me that uh, is this in-person work environment. So this has been the hardest part for me to just mentally adjust. But I can't deny that we've seen this work, mm. right? We've seen it work. We didn't drop off. Now, we still pair, just like you and I are paired right now. This is the way we work, two people sharing the same task at the same time, being in a video you know, conference together, either Zoom or Google Hangouts or something like that, and sharing their code, and they work the same way they always have. Um, <clears throat> I believe, though, and I, I say this almost every day here, that there is a what I call a work-from-home tax. There's a bill being accumulated that these subtle little things, and you know how, like, you found, like, society frayed at the edges when we weren't having direct conversations. We were using anonymous feedback on Yahoo around some big political issue or something. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, where do these people come from? And you find out they're your <laughs> next door neighbors that, that just behave differently when they're behind an electronic fence or behind, yeah. a, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. And so I see that here. I mean, it's mm. not like we're, I mean, we're not tearing each other apart or sure. anything like yeah. that, but there's just this different kind of communication style. Now, where do we go long term? I all I will willing to say is my mind has been open wide to the possibilities. I think we will always have a compelling in person in office presence, but I'm absolutely convinced too that this work from home model has worked incredibly well, given team members amazing amounts of freedom and flexibility that they never had before in our work environment. And I don't want to take that away from them either. You know, the ability, if you've got a sick kid at home that doesn't need constant attention, why not work from home and just go, you know, bring them an apple every now and then or something like that. If, you know, we're up in Michigan here, we have a snowstorm. And in the past, if you couldn't get to work, you took the day off. Well, you can work from home now as long as your internet line didn't get knocked down by a snow laden tree branch or something like that. Um, and so it's absolutely worked. Uh, it will continue to work. It will continue to be a part of our company. Uh, there is, you know, I've said now there's, there's three versions of Menlo I've seen in my history, 19 years of what I now call traditional Menlo, the one you read about in Joy Inc., 18 months of pandemic Menlo. I mean, we're 500 ish days into this transition, all of us. Uh, and now there's emergent Menlo. Hmm. The thing that springs forth from the things we've learned, the things we've had to do, the things that worked better than we thought they had, why on earth would we go back on that? I'll give you a simple example. You know we do tours there at Menlo. Three to 4,000 people a year would fly from all over the planet, land in Detroit, drive to Ann Arbor, book a hotel room, spend anywhere from a day to a week with us by the thousands every single year. And then, of course, when the pandemic hit, that all ended, and there would have been a dark room to see anyways. June of 2020, we said, hey, let's try a virtual tour of the virtual memo. Had no idea if there'd be interest, had no idea if it'd be compelling, had no idea if it would work. But we tried it. And we put out, you know, the people we did it for down in Tennessee loved it. They put a nice little blurb out on LinkedIn about how good it was. And we just wrote a simple message in response, thanking them for their kind words. It said, if any of your friends want to come visit, just write us at experience at menmotivations.com. Oh, my gosh. We started doing 11 tours a week. Wow. In those early days. <laughs> it would, came at us like a flood. Oh, we have man. had over 
2,000 people since June of 2020 visit from 64 countries and 39 states. And of course, you know, they don't have to get on an airplane. All they got to do is click on a link and they're with us. And when they're done, they click on the leave meeting button and they're back in their work environment. Zero cost. The tours are free. And so they get to, you know, they get to experience Menlo in a way that uh, no one had ever been able to do before. Why on earth would we stop doing that when we can have people come back in for visits? We'll still do that, too. But this virtual tour will be a permanent thing we do from here on out. Yeah, you probably get, you know, 70, 80 percent of the value from 20 or 30 percent of of the time and, and money and effort involved with it. And there's people who can come now who have never been able to come. We have exactly. visitors coming yeah. from the Philippines. Who, there's no way they could get on an airplane, fly to the United States, you know, spend a yeah. week in Ann Arbor. Just the cost alone would be prohibitive. And then the imp- imposition on their time would be cost prohibitive. Yeah. Yeah. I've done this virtual tour and it was wonderful. So any of you out there who are considering it, I'm, it really is a, a, a cool way to experience Menlo and the, the innovations that, uh, Menlo Innovations has come up with. Um, we're, we're running up on time. So I'm just going to do one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, a, another pillar of the Menlo way is this thing called high tech anthropologist. And you've talked a little bit about it. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people now. I think we're just over a hundred episodes on this podcast. And, and one of the things that not always, but I'll often ask is, what are, are some of the biggest problems associated with product development? Or in, in your world, it could be with software development. And the most common answer I get is not understanding the problem well enough. So you have this beautiful solution to that in your high-tech anthropologist. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and and how you have seen the high-tech anthropologists help mitigate risk associated with not understanding the problem well enough? Even, let me extend this question just a a little bit more. Um, A lot of our customers, and, and probably us as well, think that we understand the problem pretty well, right? And so why would anyone spend this extra money and time to to do this really deep dive into the problem when, hey, I already know what the problem is. We we need to do X, Y, and Z. That's it. We just need to do this. Why, you know, why spend more time and money in it? Uh, can, can you talk to that just a little bit? Absolutely. So let's go back to joy. Let's talk about what joy is all about. What did I say? It was like we're, we want to delight the people we intend to serve. Well, how often did I in my life, maybe you and yours, and maybe some of your listeners, spend weeks, months, years working on something, got it delivered, sent it out to the world, and no one ever used it? Because they said, I don't need this. Why did you create this? This doesn't fit my needs. This doesn't answer any problems in my day. It happens all the time in the software industry. We build stuff because some smart, brainy software engineers are sitting in a room with a wife. I think people have this problem. I think they'd like to work it like that. Really? Like, do you have the problem saying, well, no, but I can imagine what it'd be like for them. Well, why don't you stop imagining and go out into the world and observe the people you're trying to delight in their native environment? And that is the simplest description of our high-tech anthropologists. In the lean community, this would be called the go to the Gemba team. Go out and observe, not interview, not interrogate, not do a focus group, which I call dominant personality disorder groups. Go watch them work, right? And then watch the mistakes they make in their current work. Listen to their frustration, learn their vocabulary. And as we go out, because our customers usually say, hey, we've got this problem. Well, we want you to solve it. Well, I will tell you, one of our big posters in the room is, what problem are you actually trying to solve? I'll give you a simple example just to show how far afield this can go. There's a customer of ours who, big logistics firm, had grown nationwide through acquisition. And every one of their acquisitions had a different CRM, Customer Relationship Management. And they wanted to unify it across the whole country. 
And they said, the biggest problem we have is we have this, you know, ununified system. Everybody's doing their own thing. And a lot of times for a logistics firm, when you're moving stuff from A to B, you call the wrong office. You're supposed to call B office, but you call the A office. So the A office has to transfer the information to the B office. And if you've got two different systems, some gets lost in the translation, you lose the job, and your revenue is affected. And they said, we need a unified CRM system so the problem goes away. Now, I'm guessing you hear this. I hear this. So the engineer me says, of course. Makes total sense. Right. But then we asked this customer. We said, could we go visit? your offices. And they're like, well, why do you need to do that? Well, so we just like to see if the people have the problem you think they do. Oh no, they have this problem. I can guarantee you they have this problem. This is exactly the problem. We don't, you don't need to go, but we were gentle. We're, we explained what we do. And he said, look, if we find out very quickly, it's exactly the way you describe it. We're good to go. We'll move ahead. Like, okay, you'll find out. I don't know why we're wasting money on you. Go visit these offices. <laughs> right? <laughs> So we go out to an office like in Fort Wayne, Indiana or something, and we sit down with them and these people are like, so why are you here? Well, we're trying to create this unified CRM system for your for your management. Well, why would we need that? Well, this is what happens. You know, people call the wrong office and, oh, well, we would never transfer data from one office to another. Really? Why not? Well, our office's bonus is based on us outperforming every other office. If we send a job to another office, they'll outperform us and our bonus goes down. If we if they make us do that, we'll fat finger the data. We won't absolutely I don't care how unified the system is, we'll lie about it. We'll we won't put it in at all. Wow. Uh huh. That's right? huge. How about we understand the humans before we start figuring out oh, what problems man. we're trying to solve? So we had to carry this water back to our customer up in corporate, and they were not happy with us because they were like, you're supposed to be solving the problem we told you. Like, you guys got a different problem. I'm not saying the solution you're imagining won't one day work, but until you review your compensation system and your bonusing structure, the dream you have for a unified CRM system will not come to fruition. What problem are you actually trying to solve and we have i got stories galore that sound like that Aaron. that is such a great great story well that's again why you are the chief storyteller <laughs> <laughs> rich this has been just so delightful i what a what a treat this has been for me to to get to talk to you thank you so much for for sharing all of this um before I let you go, how can people get a hold of you? And there's so many reasons to get a hold of, of you or Menlo. I mean, the obvious one is we need a piece of software developed, but also there are all these workshops that you offer about project management and time management and, and there are the, the tours, uh, virtual and probably in person in the future again. Um, uh, learning more about the books that you've written and speaking engagements, just a plethora of reasons. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and Menlo? Yeah, uh, you know, the easiest way to investigate the company and all the different offerings is our website, MenloInnovations.com. Uh, if you want to link in with me just to have intimate conversations, feel free to do that. I'm on LinkedIn, you know, Rich Sheridan from Menlo Innovations. Uh, if you mention that, hey, I heard of your podcast with Aaron, uh, you know, that's um, – you know, then I'll say yes. You know, people who just randomly reach out to me, I might or may not say yes. But if you tell me this is how you heard about me, absolutely say yes. You can write me an email, rsheridan at menloinnovations.com. I'm crazy about email. I think when I got into this phone call, I only had about eight waiting in my inbox. So I really do answer my emails, all of them that come to me. Um, read the books. Uh, they're available wherever books are sold. Um, and, uh, you know, and come on that tour. Uh, on the top line of our website, You'll see the click the link for tours and workshops. The tours are free. If you want to come spend 90 minutes with us, get a deeper dive. You get to meet with a couple of Menlonians, ask them questions beyond the chief storytellers. Answers. You get to talk with the actual Menlonians who, who work in this environment every single day. And we'd love to have you. And another thing I'll say about the tours is uh, Menlonians are not shy about being very transparent. Mm -hmm. I asked all kinds of questions, some of which I thought, oh, there's no way they're going to answer this. But 
They were very, very open with everything, and it was so rewarding, such a great experience. I mean, how can you beat that? F- uh, 90 minutes for free learning about world-class processes that are proven to work. It's just phenomenal. So, Rich, thank you again so much for, for building Menlo and for spending some time with you uh, with me. Again, it's just been a, a pure delight and, and a huge treat. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for uh, inviting me onto your podcast. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.